Good afternoon. I guess um, we're about ready to start. I wanted to introduce um, myself, Ed Corrigan, with Brandt. I'm the agronomist and run a lot of the research projects at Pleasant Plains. Got with me Brian Hashmeyer. He has kind of been our, our lead chemist in developing a lot of our products, but he heads up our discovery and innovation group. And so we're going to a little bit tag team this. And uh, to start with, I want to take a couple of minutes and just give you a quick overview of Brandt. I see a lot of faces that I, I do recognize, uh, know a little bit about us, but I, I got to thinking about the group down here. And, and uh, so I thought I'd run through a couple of slides just to quickly review what, uh, what Brandt is. And with that, I'll see if I can get this to work. So we really have three um, uh, generations of people that uh, we are really working with today. And this is one of the old fertilizer uh, trucks that they started with, a Rio. And we've got Glenn and Evelyn Brandt. Glenn and Evelyn, her brother and sister, started back in 1953 and currently uh, still maintain ownership uh, in that family. And so it's a privately held company. Currently, uh, the executive offer running it is son Glenn Brandt, or Rick Brandt, and his daughter uh, up on the truck is Sierra. So we've got three generations that are currently uh, working through since 1953, and it's um, been a real upward uh, climb for them. Glenn and Evelyn really created a, a company that um, really has three different lines, and when you get into Illinois, you really know us as retail. When you get outside of, of Illinois, we're in the specialty formulations. But to really uh, work within our retail group, we also, Glenn had a vision to be able to store uh, products along the river, terminals, to be able to supply our retail. But he also had this uh, vision that we needed to also work with other dealers that were around that area and help support their business. So it's really been a culture that has been part of what has set this company up to uh, be able to have a vision to grow into the specialty and really become um, quite large within the last 10 years to where now we're um, looking at some of the orange dots is our production points where we're actually around the world and the red area being the areas that we're actually involved in as far as uh, supply and shipping our products. Um, so we're really um, have had a lot of good growth and look to continue to grow. And uh, it's all about trying to have products that make meaningful difference for the growers yields, but also return on investment. So with that, we're, we're really gonna go back to the real uh, heart and that's the ends up zinc. And I'm gonna let Brian take over and then we'll uh, look for questions uh, towards the end. Yep. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come out here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, enzymes and why Brand's so interested in that and, and why we think um, it can make a big difference for you growers. Um, so we, we know at the grower level um, and also at, at the development level, there's a lot of interest in soil health and what makes soils, good soils, and how that impacts uh, the growth of our plants. Um, so Brant has done a lot of research on this and trying to figure out what can we do to improve soil health and how do we get that plant out of the ground uh, so the corn takes off better so you get better root development. And one particular area of interest would be enzymes. So when we talk about what makes up soil, you guys certainly know nutrients. There's a lot of living organisms, microbial organisms. There's a lot of residue in the soil. Um, and most people are familiar with that, but there are also a lot of enzymatic activity in the soil. And if to have a healthy soil, you have to have good enzymatic activity. So there's definitely a connection between a healthy soil and plants that grow well and enzymes. So where do enzymes come from in the soil? Um, it's a good question. Most enzymes are coming from the bacteria in the soil, whether it's the microbial or the fungi. They produce enzymes and they exude them and they put them in the soil. The plant also, through the roots, will release enzymes out near the root surface. So you'll have enzymes in the soil, but they're all there either from the microbial or the living activity or from the plant itself. 
So one question that always comes up when I start talking about this, why enzymes instead of microbes? Brian, you just told me that most of the enzymes are coming from the microbes or the, the living bacteria in the soil. And this is indeed true. Part of the reason of we want to do that is if we can put a certain enzyme out there at a very high concentration, we can control a very specific reaction to occur. And microbes just don't put enzymes out. They put enzymes out when they need something. They need to either break down organic residue to create nutrients so they can grow. And we also know that microbes vary in population. They can spike up, they can go down, the pH has to be right. So we thought, well, if a lot of the value is coming from the enzymatic activity, if we could isolate enzymes that really benefited the growth, that might make more sense than trying to do the microbes. Now, I'm a big fan of microbes, and I think they're a big part of soil health, so I'm not talking negatively about microbes, but we're talking how can we deliver even more efficiently and increase activity in the soil that's beneficial to growth. So that's why we focused on enzymes. Where are the enzymes in the soil? Well, not surprisingly, they're in the uppermost part of the soil, in the top four or five inches. That's where most of the living organisms are, and they're mostly around the root surface. Now, whether you guys realize it or not, enzymes are having an impact on day-to-day -day agriculture for you guys. Have you heard of the term urease activity? A lot of you are putting out urease inhibitors to keep your urea from breaking down. Phosphatase enzyme breaks down organic phosphate in the soil and releases phosphate, and there are tons of different enzymes. So they're impacting your agricultural practice on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and whether you guys realize it or not, you're kind of familiar with it. A lot of us know about stabilizing nitrogen, we know about urease, we know about nitrate reduction. So it's not like we're not familiar with it, but how do we utilize that to improve growth? So this is an enzyme. It's a globular protein. It's made up of a bunch of other proteins, and they form a very specific reaction. Some of the things that you guys should be somewhat familiar with, if not, the nitrogen cycle. Enzymes are directly involved in the nitrogen cycle in the soil. The phosphorus cycle. The carbon cycle, breaking down all that organic residue, the, the starches, the cellulose, the lipids in the soil. Also, general protection from pathogens. Now, we're really focusing on certain enzymes that are going to deal more on the carbon cycle and the phosphorus cycle. But these are very, very important parts of, of everyday soil health. So here's an example of an enzyme. In this case, this is a phosphatase enzyme. So what enzymes do very specifically is either they break something apart or they put something together. They're critical for life. They're the catalysts that make reactions to occur. In this particular example, we have phosphatase, organic phosphate. On the left-hand side, or left-hand side, the organic phosphate fits into the enzyme, and the enzyme breaks it apart and releases phosphatase. So some enzymes break them down and some put them together. So another example would be nitrate reduction. In this example, nitrate is getting converted over into ammonia nitrogen. Very powerful process in the soil. So another interesting impact, and I think most people are aware of it, is the amount of nutrient that's stored into organic matter in the soil. I mean, this chart shows that if you have a half of a percent 1%, 2%, and so on, how much different phosphate, P2O5, or nitrogen is in one acre foot of the soil. So if you take an, an acre and you go 12 inches down, this is the estimated amount of available nutrient if it could be released. And you can see at 2% organic matter, there's 910 pounds of P2O5 in an acre foot of soil. We can also see at 2% organic matter, it's about 2,000 pounds of nitrogen. During the normal mineralization process, you're not releasing all that in one year. It's one to, to five percent, maybe depending on the on the, the climate, the soil matter, how much oxygen. So a large percent of that doesn't get converted every year. The two enzymes that we have focused on in the ends up zinc are mannanase and lipase. So mannanase breaks down. Poly, uh, polysaccharides that have mannan linkins, linkage in it. So any time you have a, a, a cellulose starch that has a mannan backbone, it'll break that down. And we'll learn that that's in the organic matter, and it's also exuded from the, the plant, so that can act continuously. Lipase enzyme 
it's going to break down all the, the lipid type molecules in the soil. And lipids tend to be the non-water soluble parts of cellular structure. It's often the cell wall structure. And that can be a little bit difficult because microbes can't get to it and break it down. It doesn't have good water flow to it. So if we can break down these organic residues in the soil, we can have a pretty significant impact on the plant health out of the ground. Now the product also contains zinc. I like to focus mostly on the enzymes because it's really an enzyme driven product, but it does have 4% zinc in it for two reasons. One is most of the time when you're going to start a fertilizer, it's nice to have a little bit of zinc. We know that to keep the phosphate zinc ratios right. But also for these two enzymes, the cofactor to make them work is zinc. All enzymes require a cofactor um, to make them work more efficiently. So by placing zinc with these enzymes, they will function more efficiently and more quickly. And the application for the ends up zinc is basically with your starter fertilizers, either infurro, banded, two by two, two by zero. In other words, we're trying to get it at the planting time near the seed, because that's where it's gonna do you the most good. And the crops that we've seen really good success are our corn, number one, cotton looks pretty good. And interestingly enough, soybeans look very good with the data. So what are the key benefits from ends up zinc? Um, higher concentrations of enzymes. We're putting anywhere from 100 to 1200 times more of that particular enzyme than in the native soil. And I always get the question, well, how do you know if you're between 100 and 1200? Well, in your really heavy, really dark soils that have good organic matter, we're probably around the 100 times. When you start to get to the sandier, lighter soils, so those ratios can go all the way up to 1200 times more enzymes that's in the soil. Increased water and nutrient uptake. Um, release some nutrients from residue, improve plant and root health, also improve tolerance to stress, and ultimately what pays to you guys, the growers, is we're seeing a very nice yield bump where we're getting ROIs to the grower level about three to one. So every dollar you're spending, we're seeing roughly three dollars back. So the mannanase enzyme, what, what is that really doing? So these are three organic structures that are typically in the soil, cellulose, lignin and hemocellulose. And if you look at the structures a little bit closer, you can see around the green circle, those are individual sugar units. So the mannase goes in and it cleaves the hemocellulose and the cellulose, releasing individual sugar units. This helps release nutrients from the residue, but it also releases in particular mannose sugar. And what's really interesting about mannose sugar is it has a very positive effect on bacteria, specifically the PGPRs, the plant growth promoting. So how many of you have heard of people putting sugar when they do a straw or do a pound of sugar, right? When you put a pound of sugar out, you're typically using glucose or high fructose corn syrup. It turns out that PGPRs like mannose sugar very specifically They'll eat glucose, but that particular type of microbe class really likes mannose sugar. So we have a very positive impact on the PGPRs. And when you just put sugar out, you're boosting everything. We're not sure what you're boosting, but we've seen a very significant microbial increase by cleaving and breaking down the mannose and the, and the cellulose. The other really interesting thing about the mannanase enzymes is we talk about plants and how much photosynthate they produce. That's a big deal, right? That's the energy backbone to the source of these crops. Well, all that photosynthate that's produced, anywhere from 20 to 60% of that gets pushed down to the roots. Some of that is for the root development and the root structure and the growth of the roots, but also quite a bit of it is exuded out of the roots in something called mucilage. And mucilage is this gel that you see on the root hairs. It's on the tips, it's on the growing tips. It lubricates the soil, it has interactions with the soil, allows for nutrient flow, allows those roots to grow. Well, mannose can specifically act with that mucilage because it has a mannose backbone in that mucilage and break that down. So those enzymes not only are acting on the residue in the soil and priming that soil to get ready, but they're also acting with the mannose that's exuded by the plant. So a lot of people ask, well, Ryan, what do you think about sugar in the soil? It's like, you don't really realize how much sugar that crop is pushing out in the soil. It's putting out way more sugar than you can imagine that you put out in that initial starter application. And in essence, with the enzyme, we're breaking out and releasing more sugar than you're putting out at one pound per acre or two pounds. Not saying that's a bad application because I've seen good responses from it. But what I'm saying is we may have a way to release a lot of sugar all the time in smaller individual units. 
So this is um, kind of a rich structure. And you can see on the mucilage, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Anyway, right here on the growing tips, that's where that mucilage is going out. And they're polysaccharides and then those individual sugars. And it's breaking that down, allows for better water flow. When that mucilage first comes out, it's very wet. But over a period of time and growing, it wets and redries, and it has a hard time getting water. By going in and cleaving it, it allows for better water flow more consistently through the roots. The other one is lipase. So if we look at lipase in the soil and lipids, how many lipids in the percent of organic matter? It's about 20% of the total organic matter is some sort of lipid content. Now lipids is a very, very broad term that would can be classified a lot of ways, maybe it's just the non-water soluble part, or it could be the phospholipids and the glycerol lipids like I have below here. But it represents a significant function of the organic residue. It also represents a part that has quite a bit of phosphate. Because this one off to your right, the phospholipid has quite a bit of phosphate attached to the end of it. That's why it's called a phospholipid. The other nice thing about enzymes is they're, in terms of soil mobility, pretty good. And what we're finding is that when we put these enzymes in the soil, we can measure how far they go. In a greenhouse setting, they can move about a 20 centimeter diameter. So when they're placed two inches next to the seed or right by the seed or in the, in the furrow, they'll actually move around a fairly decent amount. And as soon as they're in there, they start acting. They're not waiting for the seed to germinate. They're immediately breaking down organisms. And what is nice about that 20 centimeter diameter is that's the, the volume, in my opinion, that's really important to that early growth. You're priming that pump, you're breaking down, you're getting the mineralization occurring right where you really need it. When those roots first come out and they start growing in that 20 centimeter diameter, there's nutrients released, there's microbial activity up, up regulated, and it really gets that corn or the soybeans or the cotton off to a good start. So as I said, it ends up saying, as soon as you put it in the soil, it starts working immediately. And you're like, well, why am I saying that? It's fairly obvious, but that's not always obvious for a lot of things. Microbial activities, when you put microbes in the soil, a lot of times they're waiting for the seed to germinate. Yeah, they work, but they really feed off the nutrients that are coming out of the seed. Once the seed germinates, that microbial population tends to go up. Chemistry, PGRs, like uh, the Kenantins and the IBA, they need to wait for the seed to germinate. A lot of times we have the effect. So when we put these things in there, they're starting right away. They're breaking down all those nutrients and doing that mineralization in that five to 10 day period where you're sitting there. If you're like me, you're sitting there waiting, you're waiting for that corn to pop out of the ground and you're excited and you wanna see it shoot out of the ground, right? And you wanna make sure that when it germinates, it's in an environment that it can thrive in. And that's what we're really striving to create, that environment where that corn seed, when it germinates, can just boom, pop right out of the ground. This is a slide just indicating that this stuff's happening immediately. We're priming the pump, so to speak, and the reactions happen quickly. People ask me, how fast does that reaction happen on the enzyme? It can happen just like that, boom, boom, boom. As long as it's there to have that substrate it needs, it's not a slow process, it's a very fast pot process. And I also get asked about, okay, what's the life of the enzyme in the soil, which is an excellent question. Um, through new patent and stabilization process, these enzymes, they're viable in the soil for at least 21 days. That was our goal. In most soil environments, they'll hold up for the first 21 days. And then in some soil environments, we can get past. And that first 21 days is a really critical time in that crop production. So this slide illustrates the mobility of the enzyme. You'll see there with the uh, corn seed, the green stain around it. That's where the microbial activity is. And also there's no air bubbles or that uh, to me, it looks like kind of a green circle or kind of a brown circle. That's where that microbial activity is. And the enzyme activity that we put in there, it's a little hard to see on the yellow coloring, but you can see that the enzyme activity has moved over a much, much greater volume of the soil. We're affecting a much larger volume of the soil than, than microbials or PGRs just because of the nature and the movement of it. And it's working right away. It's already doing what it's doing. And in this particular thing, the reason we know they move that there's an indicator dye that shows when phosphate is released. And because that's yellow, that's telling us that there's inorganic phosphate being released from organic phosphate in the study. So 
So enzymes and microbial activity. We've done a lot of research on this, and we know very definitively that when we put these enzymes in the soil, we're increasing microbial activity. And I mentioned it before, but this is the natural cycle. You have a bacteria there, and it produces enzymes. The enzymes break down the organic matter in the soil into smaller individual units that microbes can eat, because they have a hard time eating the residue. And then they're happy, and then they, the populations may grow. Well, it may not do that if it doesn't want to, or if it's happy, it may not do that, and I can't control the enzymes that the bug's gonna create. And some microbes compete for nutrients, some are synergetic, and they put out all sorts of different enzymes. We're tailored to two enzymes, the mannanase and the lipase, and we spent the last three years trying to identify enzymes that made a benefit to the grower, so we feel very confident that we're getting very high doses of, of enzymes that'll impact yield. So these are just some examples of some studies where we did, where we have natural soil, and there's microbial activity on the red bars, and we know we were getting enzyme release, but when we add the enzyme, you can see on the mayonnaise, we're increasing microbial activity. In the lipase, a substantial increase in the activity. This is over standard soils with microbes already in them. And that simply is breaking down and releasing the organic matter into smaller nutrients that the microbes can eat and like, which boosts the population. So by the time the crop emerges, the microbial population is primed, and by the time the crop emerges, we have a lot of mineralization and the nutrients have been released. It's an ideal situation to get the corn right out of the ground. So what are we seeing in the field over the last three years? This is a pretty typical one. This is Lexington, Illinois area. Pretty decent soils, maybe two, two and a half percent organic matter. There wasn't a ton of visual on the top growth, maybe a little wider stem, but when we dug them up, you can see the difference in the roots. And then we saw that pretty consistently in most all the trials we ran. And this one was 7.2 bushels, which is about three to one to the grower. This is soybeans. We weren't sure on soybeans when we first started this. We were chasing the corn market. And not a lot of people will do two by zero or starters on soybeans, but we did it anyway, because we know there's aggressive people. They're interested in pushing yields, and there's kind of a trend. We're definitely seeing increased rooting early on soybeans. And I think because the roots start a little earlier and a better structure than they're setting the nodules a little earlier. We had pretty good yield impacts on soybeans too. If your planter is set up to do it, it definitely made sense and it paid. Again, corn, early season vigor. What we see visually, very particularly on lighter soils, we can see a difference in height, um, stalk diameter, and color. Now, it is a bit different if you get in some of the really heavy black soils, it's a little harder to see, but as the organic matter goes down, the enzyme activity goes down, and we tend to see bigger responses. So that can be anywhere from 12 bushels on the really lighter soils to that four to six on the heavier soils. So there is a dependence on the natural enzyme activity in the soil. This is another one where we could even see the difference in the height late season. And this would be a kind of a lighter sandier soil. So just as a summary, brand ends up zinc, it's 4% zinc. It's a chelated zinc, so it mixes with your starters just fine. Whether that's ortho poly, it doesn't matter. If you're running a UAN sulfur type thing, it doesn't matter, it'll blend fine. Um, two enzymes, mannase and lipase, breaking down the lipids in the soil, breaking down the mannase in the soil, releasing nutrients. And the mannase X, even very specifically on the root exudates that release sugar and break them down. And we're seeing better nutrient uptake, better root structure. And we're really seeing these plants come out of the ground and get a lot better jump to the season. So thank you, and we'll take uh, questions now if anybody has questions. So the question is really about whether there's any issues with that enzyme being in a starter for quite some time. If we get into a situation where, you know, uh, you had it already pre-mixed. No, we don't have any problems. In fact, the, the enzymes in a liquid fertilizer, um, one of our biggest things getting to market was making sure that the enzyme in the fertilizer solutions would be stable well beyond two years. So 
once you mix that in down in the starter fertilizer, it's not a problem. The only place we really have a problem if you start mixing with things that have a pH below four, and that can be a little tough on the enzymes. But most starter fertilizers in the market have a more neutral pH. Um, the So the question is, do we need additional sugar? Because I was talking about, do we need the additional sugar in people putting a pound of sugar out versus the enzyme? Um, and, and my feeling is you don't need the additional sugar. The, the point I was trying to articulate is that the enzyme itself releases a lot of sugar naturally from the cellulose and the hemocellulose. It acts very specifically by breaking down and releasing individual sugar units, which is, there's a lot in the soil. The other part of that is how much photosynthate from a plant actually goes down to the roots and is exuded out through the, the, the plant. Like, how much photosynthate does a plant produce in a minute? I mean, how many? Yeah, so, so uh, a half pound of sugar, um, if you run the calculation, should work out to about 54 seconds worth of photosynthate yeah. is what you're actually getting out of that half a pound. And, and, and I guess the real conclusion is, is um, our, that's a, such a short term uh, fix for the plant and the soil, and it's probably back to trying to use Mother Nature's own ability to use this mucilage to help exert that uh, that sugar. So that was a little bit uh, a little bit of a long explanation. Yeah. The other thing I'd, I'd throw in there is most of the sugar that we get is either glucose or high fructose corn syrup. That's the really cheap, easy sugar to get, and that's what's in a lot of formulas. Um, the enzyme we have is very specific to, to mannose. That's why it's called man, mannanase. Uh, and what we're seeing is the mannanase sugar um, really has a lot more activity in the soil. And it ha the plants can uptake mannose-based sugars too, and there's a positive impact from that. But it also has a positive, I think, a more positive impact affecting the microbes you want to affect positively. Good question. The price per acre, the grower cost is approximately seven fifty an acre. Including zinc. Including zinc, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we'd we'd How court. Zinc is that gonna give you? Well, if you're doing say you were were selling like a nine percent doing an EDTA, that was usually a quart an acre a quart per acre, typically that's nine. So that's about half as much zinc. But what we found is most of the time we out yield the sequester or the EDTA zinc at 9%. It, in fact, around here, what we almost always do in the Midwest and a lot of the corn production areas. The only caveat to the, I would say to that, we do run into areas that are pretty severely zinc deficient and very responsive. In those cases, you'd run, run the ends up zinc and put a little extra zinc. There are certain like areas in Texas and uh, down south where, or even out in the western uh, corn belt, where they're, they're pretty significantly corn uh, zinc deficient. So. I'd say the bulk majority of the acres, that would replace that and give you a better yield. And I didn't put the data up here, but we did a lot of side-by-side -side trials versus zinc EDTA. And I would say 95% of the time we out yielded them. And when we didn't, it was an area where you had uh, pretty well-known zinc deficiencies, high calcareous soils. Yeah, the best, you can do this at multiple applications. And we've done this on vegetable crops and stuff where they have uh, drip irrigation stuff where you can do it. But the best use of it is early with the seed or early vegetative. Um, that's when it does the most benefit. So if you consider a, a farm that uh, has had a lot of manure on it or, and it has a real high amount of release of phosphate, <clears throat> those may be the situations where you take a, a quart of ends up zinc and maybe add another pint of of 9% uh, zinc to maybe be able to <clears throat> provide enough zinc to offset that high level of phosphate. So it's, it's back to, in most situations, we don't see that, but um, if you were to have a farm or a field really releasing a lot of phosphate, maybe short in zinc, that would be the spot that you would maybe up, up a little bit more of your zinc and still be able to get the value of the enzyme. <coughs> Oh, 
Well, we appreciate everybody's time. Thank you for coming. If you have any questions, um, I'll be around for a little bit. And there's a lot of Brant Red Church running around. We'd, we'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you.